Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. I'm your old friend, Ali, the manager at Enlightens Education. So tonight, I have our senior co college admission consultant, Meilin Obinata, to give us an in-depth analysis of how to boost your admission odds without SAT and extracurricular activity. Before we start the webinar, please let me introduce a little bit about Enlightens and what we do. We are a group of educators who have many years of experience in college admissions consulting and working with families in the Bay Area and beyond. Enlightens Education offers personalized college planning services and strengths-based mentoring, approach to identify each student's character, interests, strengths, opportunities, and discover a unique education path to realize their long-term goals. This includes guiding families through the confusing college applications process for selection, extracurricular activities, summer planning, and test prep. Our offices in Cupertino and Pleasanton are home to our full-time consultants and support staffs with an average of eight years of experience. Our years of teamwork also let us offer stability and a high level of synergy. But there are two parts of tonight's webinar. First part is Meilin's presentation. The second part is Q&A. Now let me give the stage to Meilin and get started. Hi everybody, I'm Meilin. Uh, thanks for coming tonight. So I've been doing this uh, for almost eight years and I have a JD. My students have attended Ivy's and other selective colleges. Today we're gonna cover these topics. As you see on the agenda, we're gonna start off with some recent news about college admissions as well as leveraging various strategies and policies regarding early application deadlines. We'll also discuss how you can stand out without a test score as well as making your ordinary activities amazing and how you can write an amazing essay without referring to extracurricular activity topics. Okay, so uh, this is a very exciting year, this pandemic year, and a lot of colleges are reacting. Um, here on this slide, we have some colleges uh, doing creative things with early application deadlines, colleges that might not have offered early action before, they're, they're dipping their toes into that water or even offering ED2 for the first time, offering many different early options to catch the high school uh, applicant. So anyway, here's a sampling of some schools you might be interested in, here's your children might be interested in. Um, and on the in the University of California front, um, we just heard a few days ago that um, the, they will be dropping SAT or ACT from three campuses. So those campuses, Berkeley, Irvine, and Santa Cruz will be test blind, uh, basically accelerating the University of California's uh, policy overall of ed inching away from uh, test score use. So now we will discuss um, different types of early application deadlines. Um, as you see, it's quite an alphabet soup. There's early action in which you apply early and you get, you get uh, information early, but nothing is binding. Um, there's restricted early action, the single choice early action, there's early decision, early decision two, and of course, regular decision. There are schools which call these concepts by different names, but basically you will need to figure out what is binding or not binding. Um, there are challenges, uh, for example, the fact that if you have a binding decision, you will not have an opportunity to compare financial aid or scholarship packages. So this, it can actually be quite difficult to decide um, where you can, where you should apply early, whether you want to be bound and if it is to your advantage. So um, one thing to note is that early decisions definitely advantage colleges because then they know who is showing up. They know um, who is actually going to fill various seats. But you, but students for thinking about it from an applicant standpoint, you really have to be careful about where you're going to put your faith, where you're gonna put your application energy. Basically with early applications, you really have to 
be very clear and do your research thinking about what is going to be a really good fit for you. Um, I heard from someone about a student who applied EB2, meaning this was binding. However, it was not ultimately this person's dream school. So unfortunately, uh, this person subsequently learned or learned that um, she was admitted to her top choice. Unfortunately, she was bound by the ED2, and so she fell into this ED2 trap, which is something you don't want to do. So it is really to your benefit that this is a definitely a measure twice, cut once situation in that you want to do research, you want to think carefully, um, matching information from your profile to that of the various colleges to figure out what would be really the best choice. If you only have uh, one chance to do, say, early decision, or if you're going to do a combination of like early action and ED2, et cetera, et cetera, you, you want to consider an overall strategy because if you fall in love with the wrong school or you make you make a binding choice uh, without having all your eyes open, it may not be to your advantage and may actually be quite disappointing. Okay, so I have this slide just to remind you, you want to, um, you want to tailor your strategy for the profile. So this year, uh, as I mentioned at the top, a lot of colleges are just not going to put much weight at all, or they may not consider they're not requiring SAT or ACT scores. Um, so how can you possibly stand out? So let's think about how colleges are looking at applicants in general with holistic review. So as you see with this slide, there are aspects that are under the student's control. Those are the areas in green. Um, and there are things beyond one's control. If you look at sort of the three o'clock, which is standardized as that is going to pretty much go away uh, as all the logistical problems and the coronavirus, they're making it so colleges that just say, you know what, you can apply whether or not you have a test score to report. So they were not, they're not going to hold that against you. This year is just so extreme. We we want to hear from you even without the test score. What does that actually mean? What does that do to the rest of your application content? So there are different components, right, to an application. Uh, you can think of it as like a container. You are reporting your GPA, uh, what, you know, if you took a test score, of course, now it's optional. Um, your activities list and the essays. So. Now, if you consider what are the comp how important those components are, if you're taking test scores basically off the table, then the importance of everything else, right, ha has to rush in and fill the gap. So Columbia, when they do holistic review, this is how they see it. Um, they're looking at rigor, educational context, personality, um, there are many factors that are weighing to consider whether or not to accept you. They say, we take a holistic approach. This is very common um, to selective colleges. Um, UMichigan uh, has something similar. They might call the, the factors different um, names, like secondary school academic performance, but it's ba basically you're reporting your grades. Your grades um, and the courses you took, um, the kinds of recommendations you're getting from teachers. What are they saying about you? What kind of personality do you have? How, how do you contribute to a classroom? Um, they even, U Michigan even has a rating system for their holistic review. And of course, here in California, the University of California has a 14 factor rubric, which is tailored by each campus. But as you see, um, a good, you know, a good number of these really are about uh, academics and intellectual fit. 
um, where might you discuss your achievements in special projects? That's number nine, right? Nine, 10, 11, 12, um, 13, basically nine through 13, those are all up for grabs. They could be either extracurricular activity descriptions um, or they could be something you discuss in the essay. Okay, so this, like I said, this year, that piece of the pie is pretty much becoming de-emphasized. So that means all the other parts of the pie are bigger. Okay, so it's very important to consider the extracurricular activity descriptions on the essays. Those are elements that are within the control of the applicant. Okay, so how do you maximize these, right? First, you want to make each description really shine to the best of its ability. Whatever you're doing, make it sparkle. So what are the things that you've done for a long time? Or maybe you made an impact. Um, what is showing off your talents, your skills, uh, your character? How do you influence other people? You need to inventory the things you do when you're not at school. The University of California application, uh, for example, it gives you 20 spots. There are 20 spots. Um, I'm not saying you have to fill all of them, but you do have many choices in terms of discussing paid jobs, extracurricular activities, uh, classes you took outside of high school, any kind of volunteering, and they do give you quite a bit of space. Um, there's space for any titles or organizations you're working in, as well as the activity itself and the level of your involvement. That's a lot of um, contemplation. It's basically like a resume for a high school student if you really think about what an activities list is. Here's an example. So in the case of this student, um, he did not have a very long list of activities. So he would want to put his best foot forward, right? So if you say, hey, I deliver pizza orders, uh, you're basically just telling the admissions reader what your job is. But if you discuss how far you went, you went to all these different towns in the East Bay to deliver orders, um, you were trying to keep a nice and clean dining environment and you're timely, you're getting a picture of a very conscientious person, right? And when you don't have a lot of activities, it's very important to treat each one as a precious thing. That's how you get from, I deliver pizza orders to the description you see here. You want to emphasize the significance of each aspect of that activity. A lot of you might be volunteering somewhere. Um, and if you just tell the reader, this club is about volunteering. <laughs> we do X number of hours. Thank you very much. That's pretty dry. And it really doesn't tell the admissions readers anything about you. That first description, it doesn't actually show that you accomplished anything. Whereas telling your reader how much money you raised and the parks or different sites you beautified, you're, you're letting your reader have a picture of what that volunteering means um, so that it's not some abstract thing and it's not just a matter of racking up hours. Um, so I have a case for you, Jack. He had a below average he was attending below average California high school and his unweighted GPA was 3.56 and his SAT score uh, was 1120. So kind of academically, he's not in the best position, right? In his case, uh, I believe when he came to me, um, his only activity of note was piano, but he wasn't interested in applying to music schools. So immediately you have this quandary of just piano and not having any activities really associated much with other things. So I was getting to know him and I learned that he actually did things around the house. Like some kids, uh, you know, they, they, they don't have a lot of responsibilities at home. But this one, um, he undertook gardening um, to actually provide for his family uh, vegetables and fruits 
and you know if his mom or his sister they wanted to grow flowers he prepared the soil so this this racked up many um experiences for him right and he he did this i think i think since middle school but anyway in the activity section you discuss what you what you did from ninth grade onwards so you get this picture this is a uh, someone who plans right like a farmer <laughs> he literally plants right so you you need to think about what will happen to the seeds and so on we also made him open an online store so he had some interests related to some pets which i'll discuss later and this opening the store made it so that you can connect his interests so now you ha go from having like one activity of piano, piano, piano to having say three. And in that context, right, have, you get a deeper picture of who he is. Um, and it's a much more interesting picture. So that's, that's one case. Um, for this other case, um, this student, much higher GPA, but uh, challenging SAT situation, um, attending a pretty uh, fairly competitive Northern California high school. Oh, I'll call this person James. In his case, uh, he, he had a bunch of activities. Uh, his strongest was painting, but he didn't want to major in art. <laughs> so <laughs> he did a lot of painting, um, you know, really great artist, but art was not, he did not want to limit himself to art when he was applying to college. So what to do in his case. So in the process of getting to know him, it turns out that he had created a club, but he founded something. He was part of a Chinese club. He coached kids in, in volleyball. So if you just sort of scatter things around and don't organize and you don't realize, oh, you know, the thing in common is actually leadership in all those activities. It also turns out that he had experience in different kinds of uh, nonprofits and businesses. He worked in an after school program. He taught various subjects um, that was 20 hours a week. So this is something he really treated like a, a, a part time job. He also undertook uh, learning about personal finance and economics. So now you get this pattern of uh, curiosity and investigation and business and organizations. So now this picture becomes much more interesting than just someone who's been painting the entire time he's been in high school. Um, so it is very important to treat the extracurricular, extracurricular activity list as uh, precious, precious uh, real estate for on the college application. Okay, so people worry about how can I write a great essay if I don't have any amazing extracurricular activities? So that's, um, we'll dive into that now. Um, just on a logistical note, the University of California, uh, they require four prompts and you have a maximum of 350 words, but Common App, which is used by most private colleges and by a lot of out-of-state public schools as well, you have about a page and a quarter, 650 words. And expectation is that it's very nuanced, very personal. And the other challenge is you don't want to repeat yourself in that most of these private schools or out-of-state schools, any school using Common App, they typically have a supplemental essay in which you must address things specific to the college. They might ask you about a major direction or why you want to study in a certain program at their college or why you're interested in their college at all. So the personal statement um, not only needs to be personal and nuanced, um, it also needs to navigate this area in which you, you need to sort of avoid certain topics as well. Okay, so how, how do you do that? Why do you do things like that? Um, they want to get to know you. So the essay is really in lieu of an interview process. So when you're trying to get a job, right, you might send in a resume and a cover letter, but to get the job, people want to talk to you. Um, 
maybe now in COVID, right, it's all remote and so on, but still, um, they want to get to know who you are as a human being. What will you be like in a team? That sort of thing. Those personal dynamics, those are the things that you, you will want to convey in a personal statement. Who are you as a person? What makes you tick? Are you creative? Are you serious? Tell us about yourself, right? Which is honestly, it's a question most adults would never want to answer. Okay, so fortunately, uh, we do have a process to come to the rescue. There's lots of getting to know students in the intake process, and we discuss uh, ideas and how to outline and so on and so forth. Um, I also want to mention there are a lot of times that essay topics, they need to match the student. You want to avoid cliches. There's, all, there's a whole minefield, right? People choose to obviously say, oh, man, like, uh, one of my students, actually, he told me that his friend uh, wanted to basically, he took a story from my student's life, and he tried to write about that for his college, uh, one of his personal statements. I said, that's not a good idea. Write, tell your friend to write about his own life. You're writing about your life. So it's very important that, um, you know, you don't want to pretend to be anybody else. You want to be yourself. But you also want to give your reader an idea of a destination. You are ultimately driving your reader to some point. Um, so, for example, if you're telling a really sad story, but there's no lesson at the end of that rainbow, then you've made them feel terrible for no apparent reason. So you want to make sure that whatever you're telling them is relevant to revealing something about your character, your personality, something of interest to you, and something that will make the whole application hold together as a package. That sounds like a tall order. Uh, of course, I, I've been doing this for a while, so I think this is, I think this is normal, <laughs> but it, it's, it's not an easy thing to actually do. Here's an example of um, one of my students, like before and after. Uh, now this, this student, believe it or not, um, was the editor in chief uh, at her high school, along with a whole bunch of other things. But if you look on the left, um, saying, writing things like, hey, I wanna be a better person. Uh, <laughs> there's no meaning to life you got to choose what you want. You might say, okay, that kind of sounds like it could be like a athletic shoe ad, uh, but it doesn't really tell the reader anything about the applicant. So if you look at this text on the right, you know, staining mouse brain slices and uh, putting on a work uniform to, to serve drinks and pastries, making drinks and pastries for customers to enjoy. This actually gives you a picture of a real person doing actual things. Um, set aside the fact that, yes, not everybody can have such an internship, but um, let's say you have a part-time job. How are you going to talk about that? What When you see her write, hey, it's for people to enjoy those drinks and pastries, right? So um, you get a sense she, she actually likes working there. Um, and that is much more interesting than saying, I want to be a better person, right? Which is kind of how it starts off on the left. So this is what the essay process is like. It's a lot of back and forth. I tell the student, you need to be specific. I want specificity. Uh, making general statements is something anybody can do. Telling stories about yourself is something only the student can do. I always tell students, I'm not, I didn't live your life. Uh, only you live your life. So you have to tell the stories in your life. Those have to make it into the essay process. So anyway, she was accepted into the Columbia School of Engineering. So there's that. You might say, okay, Mailing, that's fine for your student who's all fancy and doing an internship and so on and so forth. Um, but I have different problems, right? I, I don't have interesting extracurricular activities. Okay, well, don't worry. I don't want to say I have seen it all, but yeah, I have seen a lot. Okay. This is where, when you don't, when you're not fancy, right? But you still want to show you're likable, 
you're mature. Um, and I would caution you not to use up all your SAT vocab because that's not a good move either. Um, how do you show off all your strengths um, when you don't feel like you have a lot of impressive things to discuss? Are you picking the right topic? Um, it's very important not to tell your reader things they already know. So for example, uh, video gaming necessarily as an extracurricular activity, uh, unless you are competitive, because I would say right now, you would assume a lot of people are video gaming, right? Making that constitute an extracurricular activity, that, that would take a lot of work. Okay, so does, that doesn't add anything. Um, are you telling a story? Um, is it about you? Are you writing about your grandma or, or someone else, uh, like Bruno Mars or somebody? Okay, so choosing the right topic and make sure, making sure it really matches what you want to say uh, through your application overall is very important. Does it answer this question, what makes you you? Like, what makes you tick? Okay, here's a case, uh, one of my uh, students. Okay, so you might think it's great when, uh, let's say, you know, this Silicon Valley kid with a really high uh, GPA, a great test score, um, let's see, going to a uh, great public high school, um, you know, writing, being leader in the school newspaper. You might say, that's great, right? This is like a slam dunk case. Uh, but, but no, <laughs> no, um, this student had problems writing. Um, and, and why is that? Why is it so hard to write? Because there's, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen this, but with or without great academics, you can have procrastinating, you can have fighting, uh, the family can be fighting. Uh, this family was fighting about various topics and the topics would change. I'd see drafts and the topics would change again, so on and so This went on for quite some time. So you might say, yeah, man, so, <laughs> You're stressing me out, telling me this story. <laughs> Please let stop the torture, right? Okay, so what, it was so bad, by the way, at some point, I have this picture of Lychee because um, uh, the family ended up, uh, I guess one of the parents was very exercised and kind of stressed out. And um, they said, man, here's, you know, I'm sorry about all that. So here's some, here's some Lychee. Um, we'll be more calm the next time we stop by. Okay, so one of the reasons they're fighting is because of the student's messy room. Okay, and you're like, okay, yeah, mainly. What does this have to do with an essay topic? Believe it or not, uh, I I asked my student, okay, so why why is your room messy? Um, you know, and this is something that they would scold her about. Okay, you might say, how could you, how could this possibly be anything close to an essay topic? Okay, well, because in talking with her, we discovered this quote, all artists are hoarders. So um, I asked, okay, are you, do you feel like you're an artist, right? Are you, are you creative? And she's like, yeah, I, I, I'm a creative person. I wanna be creative. I said, okay. Um, let's find a way to connect that messy room with that sense of creativity, with that sense of artistry, right? So now, instead of just a messy room, you have kind of a direction, which is how can you take the reader from a messy room to like a reconciliation of that room so that it's something else? Where do you want to take the reader? right? We want to take the reader somewhere. So I said, you can take the reader from the messy room, right? You're going to structure it so that you might start out discussing the messy room. You're going to bring them to however you see it, which might be like a treasure chest. You see this room filled with all these precious things. And that's what happened. So that is that we decided that was the structure. So when I work with students, 
I think it's really important to figure out what's the key to really understanding that person. How do you unlock all the secrets and ideas and all the creativity? You need to get all those keys in the feedback cycle so that you can choose the best ideas that come up in the process. And that requires rapport and time and trust. In this case, this student was accepted into uh, Columbia. In this other case, um, and actually I discussed him a little bit earlier, this is the piano kid. So sometimes when you're getting to know students, um, you know, it can be hard if they're interested in things that they're, they think I'm going to judge. Um, but I, I don't want to say I've seen it all, but I've seen, I've talked to a lot of different teenagers, right? So things that other people might think are weird, I'm not weirded out. Okay, so it's very important in the intake process to set judgments aside. Um, this student, he was able to trust me and tell me uh, about what he really liked to do. So when I asked him, right, what is really unique to him, he loves insects. He really took care of these things. Um, they were like his children. He even did research when they would get sick. Um, so he kind of became like a veterinarian of these insects. When you read what he wrote, um, you get this sense that he can really take care of something. He can have responsibility. He can be mature. Now, when you have a 3.5 GPA, and you might, you know, he's not attending the, the most academically strenuous high school. It's very important to convey the message that you can actually handle going to college and having responsibility. This essay did that. You see what he is like when he decides something is important to him. So that that is why I thought this is a good essay topic and I pushed him to really explore all aspects of this, um, this interest. So ha being able to handle a topic so that it really portrays you uh, accurately, that's very, it's a very important thing. All right, thank you, Maylene. Can you apply, uh, can you still apply a scholarship if you're doing an ED application? I guess Prince is asking if you decide to do an early decision, um, can you still apply a scholarship? So one, one issue with uh, early decisions is that if you are indeed doing ED, it is binding whether or not you have any kind of scholarship or financial aid information. So if you still want the opportunity to weigh that information, then um, ED is not the route to take for you. All right, next question. Um, how to choose ED1 or ED2? What's the difference? So ED1 is typically um, around November 1st. ED2 tends to be the, around the regular deadline that that could mean December or January in certain cases. So that is really going to depend on how you do applications wise. Um, let's say if you're applying to a bunch of schools in November, if you're going to do early action, that sort of thing, um, you might not want to be bound in say, your first round, but maybe you would want to be bound by the time January rolls around. Uh, that definitely depends on your specific case. Um, I had a student, she was being uh, recruited actually by a college. They, they wanted her to apply ED2, um, but she, she didn't want to. Anyway, they accepted her anyway, but you have to know whether or not you want to be bound. So um, there are many things you want to consider when you're deciding between ED1 and ED2. Oh, here's another question. How do you come up with essay topics? Well, that is a very good question. So um, in my case, it comes down to really getting to know students, understanding um, their strengths, 
and weaknesses and everything in between because what you choose as an essay topic has everything to do with your overall profile. So as I mentioned earlier in the webinar, you want to choose topics so that you're not repeating uh, what other parts of the application are doing. So if, if you have an aspect of your extracurricular activity list or your transcript, which says, hey, I'm really into like history or whatever, do you want to keep repeating yourself? No. So choosing topics, um, that's definitely one of the benefits of working with someone like me who's literally read thousands of these. I've read, yeah, I've read so many of these. I think it's okay to pick like a, something that comes from your real life, but how you approach it should not be cliche. So you just, you're, you might be thinking, okay, Mailing, you just said two very contradictory things, but I promise you they're not, they're not actually contradictory. Um, so I might say, you know, do you want to talk about someone else? You, I think you were asking someone else dying um, or liking something that isn't normal. Well, you saw what happened to my student who really liked insects, right? You might not normally just say, I love bugs, the end. That's not a great essay topic if you treat it that way. But the right uh, structure, the right uh, approach, it can do everything to a topic, um, right? If you can take a topic like hoarding or being having a messy room and that becoming the subject of a successful Common App main essay, um, sometimes your topic has everything to do with the approach. So if you, you know, if there's something you passionately believe in, like there's just some subject and you're like, wow, man, like this is, you know, this is so important to me. If, if you really feel that strongly, I believe there's always a way to make it work uh, structure wise, sometimes not. But um, that's one of the things that I do with students. I, I really investigate why is this important to you? Why is this a story worth telling? Is it the most important story that you could tell in your application process? Okay. Okay, there's, um, <laughs> when to start writing essays? If you're applying early or if you're applying to the UC, I would say if you haven't started, do it immediately, immediately. I cannot emphasize. You might think you have a lot of time, but you don't actually have a lot of time to make a quality piece of writing. And I might add, none of your high schools teach you necessarily how to do this. You don't, I've never seen any high school offer like a memoir writing class or non creative nonfiction class, um, not even at the best private high schools. It just, or, or public. Learning how to tell stories about yourself is not something that you do in the K-12 system. So when to start writing the essays? Uh, as soon as possible, as soon as possible, and please do a great job. Next question. So yeah. how do you suggest we come up with topics for essays? I think sometimes students, they don't know how to recognize a good topic. They will dismiss topics. One of my students, wasn't even going to think about writing about what he did say for his family in his case he was kind of like uh, this is a single parent situation and he basically was like the other adults in the family and you get this sense of maturity and um, irresponsibility things that you wouldn't see on the rest of the application he didn't even think about um, writing about something like that and you know i think he was kind of embarrassed because of the uh the conflict in the family um right so maybe you know i didn't force him but i did say well you know if you wanted to write about something like this i think it could work for you so how do you pick topics um you call ali and then you meet with me uh <laughs> <laughs> I, I think honestly, a lot of times um, people think they have to pick topics that are in like a cookie cutter.
but that's actually to your disadvantage. So if you write about, you know, you, if you heard your friend is writing about something, you're like, oh, I'm going to do it too. That's actually not to your advantage for you to be writing about what everyone else is writing about. It's really to your advantage to write about something only you can write about from your perspective. Mm -hmm. The more unique, the better. But that said, please, everybody, don't start writing about insects and messy rooms if that's not really, like, the really important to you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. The next question. How will the college recruit you? How do they know your academic situation before you submit your scores? Okay, so in the case of my student who applied, um, when she applied, she, she just applied, right? But the school, they said, can, what, can you apply binding? But she just, she just didn't want to. So they had all the information when she applied, right? She just sent the entire application. She just didn't want to commit because she wanted to see what else was out there. And they accepted her anyway. So you, so the, the thing, the lesson is you must be very careful about where you will be bound mm -hmm. because you do not want to bind yourself to a school um, unless it's something you really, really want to do. Okay. All right, next question. The school counselor said the parents should fill brag sheet students. So what are good topics to write in the brag sheet? So the brag sheet is actually very important, right? Because the counselor, they might have, a, you know, five or eight, 800 seniors, right? And they don't have, they cannot get to know you intimately so that um, the overall brag sheet and the parent portion, they're all very important. So. Um, hopefully, you know your child very well, and you can discuss uh, your child, um, but I would say looking at materials like that, it's something I would discuss with a student to make sure those materials accurately reflect uh, you and your potential. Please choose something that uh, you believe shows your child and child's greatest strengths. Um, and honestly, it is something I, because I tell my students, show me, you know, feel free to share just any application material with me or even things that you just want guidance on. Something like that is, I actually am perfectly happy to discuss with students. And some of those forms can be quite long. Some of them have basically quasi college essays within them. So they can be quite comprehensive. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, so we have uh, one more question for tonight. How do college verify a student's volunteering hours? So some, some schools, depending on um, their systems, they might log the hours for you. But also, uh, depending on which school, so for example, the University of California system, um, they did they did say they will they they will randomly audit anything on the application. So don't lie. <laughs> you should never lie, and you want to be honest. Um, and don't worry, you anybody could is subject to audit at any time. And so you you don't know always um, how they verify the information, but trust me, they will find a way. They will find a way. I mean, if they, if they're saying we're, you know, anything in the application. So this is the position of the University of California. So the UC has said um, anything that you put is fair game in terms of them verifying. Okay. I just received one more question. So I guess we will answer it before we go. Should I apply to my rich or match school for ED? I think that what you think might be your match school or read school, you have to have a very clear picture of what that is. And you have to have a very honest, very honest assessment of what that is. So I would say, you know, I don't, I wouldn't want to just answer a question like that because frankly, that is the subject of plenty of discussion when you build, when you build a college list. So I would ask, 
do you really understand like how close you are to whatever they're looking for in in either case whether it's your reach school or your match school and when you say match school is it like my dreamy match school or is it really a match do you have a very objective and realistic grasp of what match means all right, thank you so much, Meili, for sharing. And uh, thank you for all of you for attending our webinar. I, um, that's all for tonight. I hope you enjoy the webinar. And if you have any further questions, feel free to reach out to me um, through the email, phone calls, um, or even you can add me on WeChat if you have one. Um, on the right side of the screen is my WeChat uh, barcode. You can scan it at me. Um, Feel free to subscribe to our uh, newsletter. You can go to enlightens.com and uh, go all the way to the bottom and you, will, you can subscribe. Uh, thank you so much. We'll see everybody next week.